Stories and Stories to talk about libraries and the role that they're playing in digital equity, digital inclusion, and prosperity for everybody. At Blandon Foundation, we're big fans of librarians, not only because we have our own mascot librarian on our team, but really, when, where, wherever we go, in, and Cala, it's wonderful to have you here, uh, is a great example of that libraries are a big partner in trying to increase access to opportunity. And through this work, um, Ann and I were really privileged, and it's thanks to Ann's blog that I learned about this, to, to find out about Adam's organization. Adam Etchelman is visiting us here came out from the East Coast to be with us for the conference, and he's with an organization called Libraries Without Borders. And you know the thing about, I, he had me at hello, he had me at his name, Libraries Without <coughs> Borders. And part of what I've witnessed um, getting ready for this conference is a kind of a new blooming relationship between Adam and Jen, who's sitting next to him. Jen Nelson is, um, I like to refer to you as the state librarian, is that true? Yeah. Or is that kind of a made up name? Um, in a legislative statute, there is no thing, such thing as a state librarian, but for all intents and purposes, yes, it's not regulated. Because, and your, your formal affiliation, Jen, is? Minnesota Department of Education. There we go. So they're here this morning to talk about, um, we want to hear from Adam about the work they're doing all across America um, uh, with Libraries Without Borders. And um, especially interesting to us is the partnership that's developing between their national organization and our state. So with that, um, I'm just gonna turn it over to the two of them and, and we'll hear what they have to say about the work they're doing to help libraries be an instrument for digital inclusion across Minnesota. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I um, seem to have moved the computer and took the screen off. Oh, <laughs> no, I had it all set up perfectly. I wonder if but, the um, HDMI. Just I can <clears throat> definitely talk without it. Um, is it did anybody? Did, did you jiggle the HDMI cord? That it maybe just I think it was this thing. Push all the buttons. All the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Twice. Turn it on. Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the HDMI. Oh. Any rate, um, I, I'll start talking if we can get it set up. We will, otherwise, Anne will be posting the slides <clears throat> anyway. So. I can fiddle while you talk. What? I can fiddle while you talk. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Jim. Oh, Great. awesome. Thank you. It's so, a tech conference after all. Let's have someone. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have someone. <laughs> I want at least one brownie point. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I wonder if it's. Anyway, um, so uh, as Bernadine said, and thank you for that introduction and the invitation to come up here this week. Um, <clears throat> in my role, I work with libraries across the state, and I got asked recently, well, like, what's your credentials? Like, how do you? Why should we listen to you talk about digital inclusion, digital divide? You're a librarian. Which is fair enough. Um, so just to give you a quick thing, in addition to starting to use the internet and uh, the old ARPA, DARPA that it was back in 1983 when I started uh, using email for the first time, um, I worked in libraries for over 30 years and had a focus um, all that time in terms of digital inclusion. I worked as a digital inclusion coordinator at the Minneapolis Public Library. I pioneered some digital media and youth training across the country back in the day um, and have worked with CTEP over the years. Um, and just really have it kind of in my blood. So digital inclusion is really close to my heart and I like being at a state level and being able to kind of support that on, through our libraries. Um, just um, so two parts to what I wanted to talk about today be, to kind of prep us for Adam. One is a little bit about libraries in Minnesota and the other is about libraries more generally um, and to kind of put forth an idea for you about how we might think about libraries being a little bit different today than they were um, say 15 or 20 years ago or before the advent of the internet. Although I will say libraries were early adopters back in 1968 card catalogs got automated uh, by the Ohio Computer Learning Center. And uh, so we've been using automation systems as long as anybody has. Um, we just haven't necessarily showed people that we're doing it. So um, in Minnesota, we have um, a total of 355 public libraries. That's one for every county, or at least one for every county. And we have a Rock County librarian with us today. So I'm gonna be looking at her to make sure I'm not over speaking or under speaking anything. Um, we have um, last, we have about 5 million people, a little over 5 million people in the state. Last year we had over 22 million visitors at public libraries, so public libraries are still drawing business. We had over 51, materi 51 million um, materials checked out, so people are still using libraries. 
My favorite statistic, though, is um, the use of the internet and wireless in libraries. So 99% of our libraries offer wireless access. We only offer in libraries about 5,000, 6,000 computers for people to use when they walk in. And last year, I think we had about 4 million uh, uses of library computers. But the use of wireless sessions, um, which was incompletely reported, was at 7 million. So we're finding people are coming into libraries using their own devices to access resources that we're making available. Some of them you need to be in the library, some of you don't. And that's fine. Hi. <laughs> um, we uh, have a fortunate in Minnesota to have a, a wealth of libraries that are really committed to working with their communities. And one of the, I was thinking about two things as I was preparing for this. Has anyone heard of a book called Palaces for the People? It's a, a guy named Eric. Adam has. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim, you got your slides back. Oh, you got my slides back. Great. My slide going to be on. I don't know how to make um, it full screen. One, two, three, four. Oh, I forgot. finding that you know books and traditional materials aren't getting checked out thank you as frequently um, although there's still a really high number I mean we're still talking millions more than people go visit the twins more than people go to Disney World I mean this is not in substantial numbers um, they just happen to be on a trend out but the trend for um, digital material checkout is um, much higher uh, and keeps increasing. At some point, those lines are going to meet. Um, I don't know if that will be in my lifetime as a librarian or not, but um, the thing that strikes me about that particular figure is the amount of content we have available physically dwarfs what we have available electronically, yet still the electronic digital circulation is continuing to increase. Um, this is just the graph of the wireless sessions and uh, that almost 12 million sessions that we have going on. Um, so, uh, next slide. I just, uh, just a pop quiz um, for a few of you here. Libraries are doing all sorts of interesting things these days, and my ask for you is which of the following can you not check out in a public library? Wi Fi hotspot, snowshoes, a guitar, or a portable public address system? Trick no, question. no cheating. Trick question. Yeah, what would you think? Just <laughs> Get all of them. All of them. No, you can't get all of them. No guitar. No guitar. Yep, no guitar. <laughs> which is just fascinating. The number of things and type of things that libraries are checking out is fascinating. You can check out a cry cup machine, sewing machine. Um, out of the hotspots have become really popular in rural Minnesota, which was actually really ple pleasing to me to see that libraries are stepping into that void in some communities and having the mobile hotspots available. It's not a perfect solution, but it jumps a little bit in that right direction. Um, okay, so just a little bit of context for libraries in general. So Pew Research, which many of you are probably familiar with, has um, over the years taken a lot of interest in libraries, kind of like the Blandin Foundation. We're very grateful for the ways that they've looked and kind of championed libraries as part of being uh, social infrastructure, which gets me back to Eric Kleinenberg's Palaces for the People. Um, that's a book, a uh, sociologist um, who wrote it, and his thesis is that libraries are an essential part, libraries as well as parks and some other organizations, but he focuses on libraries, are really part of our social infrastructure in the world today, and particularly in the United States. So if we're looking for where do we build community, how do we build community, how do we people keep people connected to the community, it's all about the public library. And we've seen that shift happening in uh, real life. Um, as well, so I encourage you, it's a really nice read too if you're interested in reading it. He'll be in Minnesota, in uh, St. Paul in early December giving a talk and presentation on palaces for the people, so I know that's a plug for that. Um, so Pew Research, as I started to mention, does a lot of work um, with libraries, and one of their more recent um, things they found was that millennials are more likely than any other generation to have visited a library. So it kind of takes apart that notion that, well, as they get younger, they don't need the library. They need it just as much, maybe for different reasons, but they're still using the library pretty actively. Um, this particular slide notes a couple of things in terms of um, extra services, literacy programs, and meeting rooms. I think 70% of our libraries have free meeting rooms available with technology access um, for presentations and stuff. And the um, unfortunately term technology petting zoos, so um, where people uh, will bring in a bunch of technology and give people a chance to experiment with it. What does it look like? What is this e-reader really about? And that sort of thing. 
Um, also, um, again from Pew, um, we know that people who use libraries are more likely to be technical savvy, um, which kind of counters the idea that libraries are for uh, and primarily used by low-income populations or people without access to resources. We're finding that that's not completely true. It certainly is in many areas. Um, there, and. I would say as a practicing librarian, that's who you notice because everybody else comes in and is pretty self-service. So it's the people who aren't self-service that you end up spending a lot of time with, um, which is good. Go on. Um, they, uh, this kind of starts to lead into my next um, point, which is that there's a disconnect between the services that libraries offer and what people want libraries to do. And people want libraries to be everything. So I want it to be that quiet space I remember when I was a kid. I want to be able to check out books. I want to be able to talk to my librarian. Um, but they also want a place to meet people, a place to go to classes, a place to learn, a people, place to get um, insight into things happening in their community. So there's kind of a disconnect that way, and libraries are in the, I would say, fortunate position of being able to address that disconnect in many ways by addressing the needs of their local communities. Um, so there um, is another set of research out there from the Aspen Institute called um, Rising to the Challenge, and it takes on this question of what is a library today? Um, we um, put forth um, three things that are library assets, the people, the place, and the platform. So to really frame libraries, rather than about books and information, but is about people, place, and platform. So the core principles are really around, and this is gonna resonate with the digital inclusion community, equity, access, opportunity, openness, and participation. So really taking those to heart in terms of how we provide services, how we think about we provide services, and how we're really responding to our communities. Um, so in terms of people, it really talks about, and I should say these are all live, live pictures from libraries across Minnesota. I have uh, the fortune of being able to get pictures at a pretty regular basis because I know Ann posts these and pictures are <laughs> always great. Um, so in terms of people, really looking at um, the library as a neutral convener, connector, and facilitator. So a librarian is no longer the person who, and this used to happen, who sits at the desk and says, yeah, that book over there, that's the one you want. And when I started working in Minneapolis libraries back in the 1980s, we actually had librarians like that. And they'd sit in a swivel chair and swivel themselves around. <laughs> like, that's the one you want. That's the one you want. People don't do that today. I think a lot of libraries are actually doing away with desks completely, except for a circulation desk where you need to have that transactional relationship. Um, but really looking at how can they start to convene the community. Libraries are known um, as neutral places, and that's a little bit of a loaded term, um, and I'm aware of that, but libraries um, take a stand for equity and justice. They don't take a stand for a political party or a political movement or anything, so it's those core principles of democracy that we're standing on. Um, so libraries are, um, we're right now, um, you may be familiar with the public charge rule that's about to be implemented, um, which is kind of devastating uh, for our uh, immigrant communities and libraries are taking a role with how can we help our immigrant communities to understand what the impact of the public charge rule is, how can we do it, so convening people around that, facilitating conversations between state organizations or local organizations, law, law, law help organizations and the people who need the assistance because people still trust libraries, one of the trusted institutions in the community. Um, let's see. Um, the place, uh, libraries have a physical and a virtual presence, and the physical presence, if you haven't been in a library recently, is pretty impressive. Um, they have learning spaces for young children that are filled with toys, manipul <coughs> I just get the word wrong, manipulatives, <laughs> things you use your hands with. <coughs> um, they still do story times and have story time rooms. A lot of them, a growing trend is having maker spaces, so places where there's unusual technology, well, I would call it unusual technology, laser printers, cry card printers, um, I can't even think of some sewing studios, sewing yeah. machines, yeah. recording yeah. studios, so much. I mean, a whole range of things. And we're finding that's happening in a lot of our smaller libraries too, which is really cool. They're saying, this isn't available in my community. It's something I can do and I can provide. So libraries are really taking it on themselves to fill the voids that they're seeing in services in their local communities, which I applaud them for. Um, for virtual places, um, there are a number of things, and of course I have to mention that the state supports a number of online resources that are available to you free of charge. Ebooks Minnesota is one, the Minnesota 
Electronic Library is another Electronic Library of Minnesota. Um, and those are places where you can be, as you're sitting here today with your phone out, you could be um, going in, checking out a book, and it wouldn't encourage you to read it while I'm talking, but you could be doing that as we're, as we're having this conversation. So we've really tried at a state level to reduce barriers to access. So we authenticate things by IP. So if you have an IP that's ranged in Minnesota, then you're good to go. Um, we also allow people to use library cards because of course we need to do that. But um, we've really tried to take some of the difficulty out of access for people. Again, it doesn't answer all of the problems that we have around access and connectivity, but it's trying to come closer. Um, the platform is, and I started to mention this, is really looking at a library as an interactive entity, entity in that third space. I thought people might appreciate the library as a service as opposed to software as a service. I just thought that was pretty clever when I saw that. Um, but really looking at how can a library um, address what the needs in the community are by working with that community, bringing in the community to be part of what the library is about and how it works and how it operates. And that's where we get to Libraries Without Borders. And so I'll just give a little preview of um, the work we've done with, with Libraries Without Borders. A few years ago, one of the things that I'm always thinking about is how do we serve people best? And we know that libraries are fabulous places and that they've got a wealth of resources and people to help, um, which is a terrific thing. But we also know that there are people who don't come to the library who may not have transportation to get to a library that's nearby. The hours may not work for them. They may not have a computer at home, so the digital virtual library is meaningless to them. So how do we start to do that? So as I was thinking about that, I just happened to meet um, the former executive director of Libraries Without Borders, and we got into a conversation, and um, he was talking about the work they do in overseas and putting what I call library installations in um, different kinds of facilities where people are at that juncture of not having access to a library but in desperate need of information. So as we got talking, we thought, well, we have that situation in Minnesota. It's not just in you know countries that are war-torn or other um, challenged areas. So we started talking and um, came up and built on part of a national movement that's really about bringing library services to alternative locations. The location that we picked on to start with was laundromats. Um, so we have a set, we funded um, from the state level, funded installations in three or four libraries at this point, um, or with three or four libraries to go out in their community and establish library satellites in the local laundromat. And that's a whole work of partnership and some other building like that, but I'll turn it over to Adam to go deeper into that. But I'm also happy to take questions. <coughs> Wow, why don't we hear from Adam first and then we'll have to discuss. I'm breathless to hear the next chapter. Okay, let's hope this works. Awesome. All right, well thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, Jen, for the wonderful introduction. So there's a reason why we just decided to really start with Jan and then kind of lead into me. And I think one of the key research questions that we talk about are those barriers. Um, in particular, the fact that we do see that library users as a whole are more digitally savvy than the general public. And we realize that libraries play a unique role in serving low-income communities and helping to bridge the digital divide. But we're asking ourselves, how can we dynamically meet them where they are? And that's the theme for today's discussion. Digital inclusion is really about meeting people where they are. So I'm gonna talk about three different things here. First, I wanna foreground um, the work of Libraries Without Borders and the broader conversation about what digital inclusion is to me and to the work that we're doing, how we define it. I wanna talk a little bit about the founding of Libraries Without Borders, how I got here. <laughs> Um, and how the organization ended up from an international group working in refugee camps to a very local organization working in laundromats in St. Paul, Anoka, and Morehead. And then finally, um, I wanna talk about some of the new projects that we're looking into across the state of Minnesota in partnership with uh, the Minnesota Department of Education. So as I was saying, I wanna begin with, with those gaps. And this is really how I try to frame 
every project and question that we're working on at Library 12 Borders. First and foremost, we're asking ourselves what barriers exist that prevent families from going to the library. And there are so many. But I think we generally like to summarize them in these three different areas. We've got transportation. Some folks can't afford a bus. Some folks don't have a bus or a car or live in a remote area. Some people don't have the time. If you're working one or two jobs, you got a couple kids, the library may not be your top priority. And we have to recognize that's the case. And for many Americans, and we know for many folks here in Minnesota, there's also a question of familiarity. People as a whole, from, and again, drawing on, on what Jen pointed out about Pew, we know that the vast majority of Americans view the public library in a really positive light. That doesn't mean they necessarily engage. They'll say, oh, I love that the library is here for us, but they won't actually you know, attend for a frequent program. And one of those gaps is figuring out how can we turn you from a passive admirer to an active user? And part of that is by thinking about digital inclusion. Now, many of you work in what I will say from a from kind of more of a, a, a digital literacy standpoint, I, I group it all in the internet access part of the school. Broadband connection, ISP providers, co-ops. But to really reach digital inclusion, I would argue that you need all three legs of the stool. And I know this isn't, this isn't uh, rocket science for many of you. We've been talking about this for ages. But you need those affordable devices, as you heard earlier today, with PCs for People. And you also need digital literacy training and support. All three pieces allow the stool to stand. Otherwise, we're kind of falling over. Now, in my work at Libraries Without Borders, um, we really focus in on what the Benton Foundation calls the community role. They're engineers and city officials, attorneys. We're asking ourselves some of those, and trying to fit in here on some of those three mandates. How can we create, publicize, and provide broadband ad adoption and digital literacy resources for residents? How can we assist in measuring and increasing neighborhood demand? They say going door to door, I say going laundromat to laundromat. And how do we build relationships among a diverse pool of stakeholders in the community that contributes to and benefits from a gigabit connection? I wanna just also frame this with a quote here that comes from a study um, in the city of Baltimore where we also work. Um, and they said, I'm just gonna read the highlighted parts here. If community members do not understand the possibilities provided by internet access, they are less likely to seek and demand broadband access. When relevant functionalities are presented, a broadband connection cannot be presented as the goal, but rather as the enabling mechanism to help individuals meet their true goals. Just kind of jumping around there. This is kind of intuitive, right? Most people, are only going to use a broadband connection, they're only going to use an affordable device if they think it's relevant. And that gets to a bigger question, how do we make things relevant? I would argue that digital inclusion as a whole should not be seen as an end, but rather as a means to, means to an end. What does that mean? It means that folks go online so that they can do online banking. It means that folks go online so that they can Skype their relatives. It means that people go online to do a million, I mean, what was the last thing you guys did online, <laughs> right? Maybe you're going online to communicate with other professionals over Twitter. Maybe you're going online because you're trying to figure out where the nearest doctor is. And we've talked about all of these different um, offshoots of digital inclusion. And what I would argue is that they're not offshoots, but they're part of the equation. So how do we get here? Um, and how did we, and when I say we, I mean Libraries Without Borders, how did we start to think about this work and where do we fit in? So Libraries Without Borders is an international organization. We were founded in 2007 with a mission to promote access to information for those in need. We began um, in refugee camps in Haiti, in Iraq, in Syria. We now work in West Africa and Bangladesh and all across Europe. And we started off with a mobile, or what some call a pop-up library. 
uh, a media center that we could set up in 20 minutes in any part of the world with an offline generator, which I also have here and I can show those who are interested. This was our attempt at trying to bring library services into communities where there was not a library, and in many cases there was not a formal school system for miles and miles and miles. In this case, we had to create the walls of the library, um, and we also had to work with local librarians when possible, or community leaders to curate content and figure out what do people want to see in this particular state. Go to the next slide. This is a photo from a project we did in partnership with Oxfam in Iraq. And then in 2014 and 2015, the New York Public Library heard about some of our work and asked us to demo um, the Ideas Box. It's the mobile library in the South Bronx. And that's how the US office began. We started testing and iterating. How can we bring library services how can, to, to those in need? And how can we break some of those barriers that I mentioned earlier? This is a photo from a project that we currently operate where we use the Ideas Box, a mobile library, um, as an effort to foster entrepreneurship and resiliency in Puerto Rico following the hurricane. Through the Ideas Box, we started to also ask ourselves, where else can we be working? So we partnered with, with an ethnologist at NYU, and we, we did organizing. Um, so we brought the Ideas Box, we brought a mobile library into a public park, as you saw in the Bronx. We brought it into the waiting room of a hospital. We brought the Ideas Box into um, a bus station. And we just started measuring and talking to folks and figuring out when are people most receptive to a library program? And when I say library program, we had simultaneously, we had early childhood librarians who were doing story time and doing uh, activities that promote early literacy. We also had one-on-one -on -one tech reference. We had open access technology and we had books all together in this space. We found that um, it depended, right? So we, we worked out, uh, outside of a grocery store for a while and we got a lot of families which was wonderful, but we realized that once you buy your milk, you're not gonna sit down for an hour and talk to somebody because your milk's gonna go bad. <laughs> um, and it was the same thing, right? In, in uh, subway stations, we realized that we were getting a high, high volume of people, but nobody wanted to talk to us for more than a minute. And we had to ask ourselves, what are our outcomes that we're looking for? Who are we trying to engage? And how can we, what's the right space for that? Lo and behold, one afternoon, we experimented with this one street corner, and it was right outside of a laundromat. And we realized that we were getting longer engagement, more sustained engagement, and that people were a little bit happier <laughs> um, and a little bit more receptive to the kinds of ideas and programs that we were offering. And thus was born, as Jen was saying, the Wash and Learn Initiative, which we call WALL-E, which is, in short, an effort to bring library services um, to laundromats and to meet families where they are. There's three pieces that are really tied into Wash and Learn. Laundromats are critical, so we have a partnership with the Coin Laundry Association, which is a national network of laundromat owners. Libraries are critical. And finally, community organizations. What Libraries Without Borders seeks to do is to create a space um, wherein local organizations and libraries and community members can interact and we can help reduce those barriers. So what exactly does WALI do? Um, getting to the what here, we provide access to tech, tools, and training, both for library systems who are interested in bringing their services outside the walls of the library, reaching communities that may not be traditionally served. Um, and the same for community organizations. We also set up technology in the laundromat that's open 24-7 at, at, uh, yeah, at the laundromat. Often people ask me, well, you know, what, is, what does the laundromat actually look like? And usually my response is, what does a library look like? People are always perplexed when I explain that we have computers available all the time at the laundromat, and then I say, go to your local 
library and look around, you'll see computers that are also publicly available. Now part of that is also it's a little bit trickier when you're in a space that's not as well trusted, that's not traditionally seen as a space for education, and that's a lot of the work that we do, figuring out how can we how can we meet people where they are, not just in the sense of going to the laundromat, but also creating a curriculum that reflects the needs of customers. Yesterday I was, um, or on Tuesday I was talking about how we've had to design programs that match the wash and dry cycle, so that 45 minutes mm -hmm. that you've got, um, and also that are relevant, right? In our early childhood programming, we do a lot of stuff with sock puppets because it's very relevant <laughs> when you have lots of socks around you in the laundromat. <laughs> A lot of unmatched socks, too, I bet. Yeah. So a couple of just interesting facts to see about laundromats. The vast majority of people travel within one mile of their home. Um, so you're, you're working really locally. Weekends are the busiest, and that's when you're getting that high engagement. And then a lot of the work that we have to do is also then figure out how can we create a sustainable program that happens on weekends that's the hardest time to get anybody to come out. You've got to pay librarians over time. It's tough to get a community organization to work then. So we have to do a lot of in internal work to figure out, you know, both in, on the capacity side and on the community side, how can we meet in the middle? Um, and then, yeah, the last thing I was going to say <laughs> um, is that, in, as you can imagine, laundromats are pre predominantly women and children. It's predominantly low income. You use a laundromat if you don't have a washer or dryer at home, usually because you either can't afford one or you don't have the space. So now, just some photos. Um, this is from one of our projects in Detroit. This is our program in Baltimore. And this is a poorly lit photo of uh, one of our locations in uh, Scott County. Um, in Minnesota, we work, as Jen was saying, um, we have four installations, um, one in Scott County, one in Noka County, one in St. Paul, and one in Moorhead. The other thing I want you to think back, um, when you're asking yourself what happens in the laundromat, it's what happens in the library. And a critical piece of the library, as Jen was saying, is people, platform, and place. So I want to think back to that, that question of people we work with community partners to have in-person programming in the laundromat at least two hours a week, if not more. So this is a, this is a schedule that's drawn from our project in Baltimore, but you'll see we have library programming happening four days a week. We've got another community organization called the Digital Harbor Foundation that does um, Scratch for kids, which is a coding oh. platform. And we also have uh, workforce development, because again, we see digital inclusion not as an end, but as a means. And we noticed that many folks are using the computers to work on their resume. And we said, that's wonderful. Let's get you from A to Z by also bringing in you know, a, a job center that can help you actually use that resume and prep for interviews. Again, going to this question of meeting people where they are, we realized that we can't just parachute in and assume that we're going to magically know what kind of space you want. And so we also spend a lot of time asking folks in the laundromat, what do you want to see? Do you want a PC? Do you want a MacBook? Do you want a tablet? Um, how would you use the Wi-Fi? Would you use it on your phone? Would you prefer to hang out in this corner? Or would you prefer to be you know, coding or working on your, your resume while you're sitting next to the washer dryer? I don't want to you know, get you guys too into the weeds. But this is just a, an example of one of the design workshops we did, where you'll see, we ask people, where do you want the bookcase? Where do you want the desks? Where do you want the books to be? Next slide. And we also had to create new platforms that were uniquely relevant um, for the folks at the laundromat. Um, and this was just one model that we created. I want to do a really quick dive uh, into some of the data that we've seen. Um, this is over time, we've seen an increase in, so this is for one of the platforms that we have at the laundromat. If you go back to that slide before, you can just see what that looks like. Um, but, so generally what we have here, we see when we first started creating this platform, it's a, it's a separate website that we helped co-design. Um, and I go back to the data, um, jump around. Um, 
we started off, it was about 100% desktops because 100% of people that were accessing the platform of curated information was at the laundromat. Slowly over time, we started to see an uptick in mobile usage. And our interpretation of that is that generally, folks would come to the laundromat, they'd see the resources there, they'd log on, and then they'd copy the URL and bring it back home with them. Another interesting piece here was the usership by time of day. So this is nationally. So across the US, we now work in eight different states, um, one of them being Minnesota, of course, but also in Maryland, in New York, in Texas, California, the list goes on. By and large, we see some of this really fascinating time data, which we're still trying to interpret, because we know that laundromats are busiest on the weekend, but what this tells us is that there's also a lot of usage midday on weekdays, and when you aggregate across all of our locations, it seems to be that um, when laundromats are the busiest, that's when we want to have programs there, that's when we want to do one-on-one -on -one tech reference, but people aren't going to be sitting on a computer for an hour. They're going to stop by and they're going to go back to their laundry. But it's generally older adults over the age of 65 that are in the laundromat during the weekdays, mm -hmm. and those are the folks who are really sitting and working. So again, this just gives you a sense of the kinds of questions that we're asking. I could talk about laundromats for ages. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, the other piece that I want to point out is that um, the platform we've been using in the laundromats has had this bizarre international trajectory. So these are all the countries in which that same platform has been used. And so what we're seeing is that new immigrants who are encountering a library resource in the laundromat are then sharing that with their relatives back home. Um, there's a lot more research that needs to be done here, but I think this is fascinating. Um, we also see uh, some interesting place making that's happening where, you know, initially we're installing those computers and we've noticed that many customers now bring their own technology into the laundromat. So they'll take their own device and bring it in because now they see it as a space for learning right. and for tech. And that's one of those outcomes that you can only learn when you're listening and learning and iterating. The other piece that we notice is that there's a lot more usage in cities like St. Paul, where we get about 15 hours of online usage a week, than um, areas like Scott and Oakley County, where we get about five hours a week, which is comparatively pretty low. And so one thing that we were working on with Jen at the State Library was to say, what are some of the other spaces that we can be accessing um, in suburban and in rural communities in particular? And this leads us to kind of the next part that we've been exploring, which is our work in manufactured housing communities, pejoratively known as trailer parks or mobile homes. Um, with the Anoka County Library, we connected with this one manufactured housing community um, that's uh, in Fridley. And we asked ourselves, can we take the same model that we've implemented through Wash and Learn and replicate it in a different space and figure out, is this a place where we might be getting higher usage in a suburban and perhaps you know, later in a rural community? Um, and the reality is we're still in that learning process. Thank you, perfect. Um, so a couple weeks ago, <laughs> Bernadine and Anne and Jen and all of the librarians from the Fridley branch and my team and a bunch of the tenants from the manufactured housing community got together and we asked ourselves, what kind of services do you want to see? And what kind of services can the library offer? And this is what we saw. You'll note, I think, that internet and Wi-Fi is the highest, so that's good to know. But we also realized that, as I was saying before, internet and Wi-Fi is not an end in itself. And we believe and we know that we can reach so many of these other outcomes through digital inclusion as well whether that's legal support, health information, career support, preschool programs, maybe not arts and crafts, but you know, <laughs> can't win them all. We also see that in general in this community, we had really low access to internet. Um, about 40% of residents did not have uh, any device or uh, connection in their home, mostly because they couldn't afford it or didn't perceive it as relevant. And by and large, most residents access internet um, not at home. So you see 65% access internet through a number of different vehicles. There you go. 
And so, um, much like Wash and Learn, where we partnered with the uh, Coin Laundry Association, we, Libraries Without Borders, is in the process now of figuring out if and how we might be able to design similar mobile library and pop-up library services in manufactured housing communities across the US. Jump to the next slide. So what's, one thing that's interesting about this community that we've selected in Fridley is that it's not a traditional uh, trailer park or mobile home. Um, it's a cooperative. And cut me off if I'm- We love co-ops! <laughs> 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 okay, ownership! <laughs> So in this, you know, just to give the quick down low on manufactured housing, by and large, um, manufactured housing communities are owned by big corporate landlords mm. who are very exploitative and neglectful. Um, often, it's a really easy investment, much easier than buying an apartment building. You just buy the land, and then you rent it to, you know, what are perceived as mobile homes. The problem is, it's incredibly expensive to move those homes. In fact, prohibitive for most families. And so when that corporate landlord sells the land, everyone's evicted. They lose their home, they lose their equity. It's a huge problem. So we've partnered with, yet again, a national organization called Resident Owned Communities USA, who has been working with manufactured housing communities across the US to help them turn into cooperatives. So when that corporate landlord tries to sell your land, they offer a loan that enables the community to own the land themselves. And we feel like this is exactly the kind of partnership that we want public libraries to be engaged with. In the same way that we're thinking about Wash and Learn, we want a laundromat owner that's invested and able to contribute um, you know, space and sometimes money to help build that, that Wash and Learn space. We're thinking the same way about manufactured housing. We want to have a community that feels invested and also a community that has a home ownership um, a home, a home ownership model that feels ethical. Um, so this, these are all of the different uh, cooperatives that are in Minnesota. There's only like nine right now. We're actually working with them right now to identify some others. Um, and some of our work right now is to figure out where are the public libraries that we feel would be most interested in a project like this, and how can we align capacity and funding and manufactured housing communities so that we can build more of these kinds of mobile services across the state. And that's where I'll end. And I think I just wanted to recap the next two slides, just bringing us back to those barriers, thinking about why we do this work and um, how this can fit into the broader question of digital inclusion. So I'm there, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Well, let's just take a few minutes. I'm especially um, wanna make sure if anybody has any questions Adam and Jen will still be here later today, but what do you got? What do you want to ask? Please, go ahead, Pam. Adam, yeah. okay, so you're on all these different locations in Laundromat. How are you getting internet service? Or who pays for it? Or do you partner with internet providers? How does that work? That's a great question. I'm going to get a little demo for you. If I can find my book bag somewhere. So when we first started, to Jen's question, to Jen's point, we were actually using the international technology we developed. So this is the this is the new server. Um, it's a newer model of the same server that we had been using in refugee camps. And when we started in laundromats in 2017, our perception, and at that time our data showed that we needed to um, figure out some sort of solution because most of the laundromats didn't have broadband connection and not in the ways that we wanted to support if we were trying to mimic a library. Um, so we created our own offline internet. Um, it was an autonomous server that we were using, very similar to a refugee camp in a remote village in, in West Africa or Bangladesh. Um, by the time we started to expand and rethink the program, we realized that we were able to incentivize the laundromat owners themselves to invest more in internet. Um, and so that's part of that tit for tat negotiation that we've been able to do, where now we're able to go to a laundromat owner and say, all right, we're gonna do this great project. It's gonna bring in new customers. It's gonna give you some publicity. In turn, you need to have public, publicly available Wi-Fi. Uh, and it needs to be good. And so now that's been a, an easy caveat for our work. And also across the laundromat industry, there's a movement now to have um, public Wi-Fi in laundromats. 
So we were kind of hitting the right, the right moment where we no longer need to be creating it ourselves, um, but can actually rely on what the owner has. I would just add to that. So in Minnesota, um, one of the things the state has been doing has been supporting the equipment. So the laptops, the tables, the bookcases, and that kind of thing. And then we asked the library to donate the staff time. So we really need all three legs of our stool to make it work. Now, if there was a really community-minded wireless provider. Well, it's turning. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. So, in, okay, okay, so in the reason I'm asking is, provider. so with any, <laughs> oh boy. I'm going to say it. Um, so we have, in a couple counties already, created a wireless hotspot, uh -huh. so fixed wireless hotspot. We um, are currently at uh, township halls. We do community centers. And we try to keep it within five miles, so anybody in very rural Minnesota only needs to drive five miles to connect to internet if they can't have it at their home. Mm -hmm. They're not using it. So um, my question is, how are you, I mean, are you, I saw your, your data up there that you guys are getting people to, to go there and to use it. Um, are, I mean, do you guys track it to where, you know, if it's not being used very well, do you move it to a different location? I mean, how are you guys, We're, you know, because I'm thinking about moving mine now too, and I'm thinking a lot, and that sounds wonderful. Um, but no, just <laughs> I guess I would say, you know, we're still in that exploration phase. Okay. Uh, we've only been at it for a couple of years and had some ups and downs with staff personnel changes at libraries and that sort of thing. Right. So um, I think we're pretty committed to the locations that we've picked. Okay. Um, but I think like in the case of Anoka County, we started in the laundromat and found that wasn't working very well and started to, with the library director there, think about well, what are some of these other places where people are underserved. Um, that we might be able to bring it in and they were open to this idea. So um, I think what your, your comment reflects on what Adam kind of started off with, which is people need to see the reason to use it before they'll come and use it. So yeah, and we and, just have it wide open. So, you know, kids, you know, they can pull up in their car and sit in the parking lot yeah. and just Wonderful. use it if they have to do schoolwork or anything like that. But yeah, yeah we do you have signage. Um, yes, we have how to log in. We ask them to put their, their name and stuff in, and that we because you yeah we, we need to keep it somewhat secure, mm -hmm. and it's also a way for us to get the data back to us yeah. and, and yeah. to be able to track. I mean, they never put their real names. They come up with some interesting <laughs> ones. Like that. Um, but we don't care who they are. We just want to know you know if it's being used, how often it's being used, and if this is something that's really needed out yeah. in those communities and. I would say for the first year it worked great. Um, in one of the counties down south, it just kind of sort of mm -hmm. dwindled off. Now maybe once a week we might have somebody sign in into one of the seven hotspots we have down there. Um, and then the county um, in the northern part of our network, which isn't very north at all, um, since we're up here, but in the northern part of our network, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, we even have one at a church where they can just sit in the parking lot and use it whenever, do their schoolwork, or no, we even have one on a main road. Um, at first, you know, we had a lot of people that were driving and needed to pull over and use it real quick, and I mean, it takes you two seconds to get logged in, but yeah, now now it's been kind of flatlining for about two years. I mean, for me, what that, and I think for me that says the, the, the value of people and facilitation is so important, and that's hard, and I recognize how hard that is. We, yeah. get, we have so many folks that come to us and say, great, can you just install a computer in a laundromat? And, or hey, can you just install Wi-Fi in a laundromat? And I have to, the uncomfortable place of saying, no, that's not what we know works, because right. we, we'll see, you know, we'll see usage. Because, you know, laundromats are a better space than yeah. probably just, you know, a public park we found. But even still, just, Providing access doesn't mean it's not the same as having a librarian or having no. volunteers or community organizations really taking that and saying to you, you've never, you know, as Casey was saying, you may not have an email. Let's get you an email and let's talk about what you would use that email for. It's kind of a microcosm of the whole Glennon Community Broadband Program. If you think about it, this idea that if you build it, they will come as a fallacy. It's not enough to just put in the technology, but this is all about 
is that community building, that engagement, and, and making the case for why. Well, it's my unhappy duty to wrap up this session. But please join me in thanking our terrific panelists. Because just, I'm so inspired. And um, let me just announce that we're going to kind of roll, softly roll into the next session. and uh, Lisa